are polar scientists, Apex is this chapter, and they have really been trying to uh, get the game up in the last couple of months and they have some new activities to present to you. Um, and maybe I have a message to all of you here who are not early career scientists but have teams with early career scientists that um, we really encourage you to also make sure that your teams know that there are networking opportunities and training opportunities with APEX um, and of course about the grants of the SPI too but um, really that uh, you pass on the message um, so that they are aware. And uh, so I, for that I pass the floor to David, David Touchet, uh, from the River Lab at uh, EPFL and uh, to answer that Shahabovma, is that right? Yeah. Um, and she is at Cryos, also at EPFL, both mission neighbors of ours. So uh, here you go. So thank you very much, Daniel, for the introduction. So I'm David, like you mentioned, I'm from the River Lab in Alton Sion. So I'm a microbiologist, uh, but I'm trying to study cold adaptation in different uh, biofilm or different organisms. Uh, I used to work in more permafrost or glacial ice, now I'm really working on biofilms in glacial, glacial rivers. Uh, hi everyone, I am also happy to introduce myself. My name is Lisa uh, and I am from uh, Cryos Lab. I'm a PhD student there. Uh, my specialist area in permafrost, though I have a background in mechanical engineering. Uh, I'm working on the system that is helping to save infrastructure on permafrost in the mountains. And today we are happy um, to present what are we actually doing in Apex and uh, what are our aims, what are our recent um, uh, happy moments to share. Uh, so why Apex? Is, uh, it's an association of early career scientists in, uh, and we are based here in Switzerland. Uh, we are aiming to get together all young scientists and uh, early career scientists and not early career scientists uh, so that's to build a big network and a communication opportunity for everybody who is involved in the polar regions, into mountain uh, science regions. Um, so for young career scientists we propose the mentoring system and um, get together activities and for um, more senior scientists who also uh, can join us uh, we are happy to provide some also networking area and uh, be involved into helping to young career scientists. Um, so yeah, the upcoming events that we are uh, presenting soon, um, first it will be one in October, uh, that is in collaboration with Polar Journal, uh, where we are aiming to um, present and to uh, show for a scientist how to get involved not only from the scientific point of view but also from the communication point of view, how to present themselves, how to adapt um, their research for the presentation of the um, people who are not, who do not have any scientific background uh, and how to advertise their research among everybody. Uh, also annually we have this event where we bring our members to uh, Young Frau Jo Meteor Station uh, and um, it's a very good opportunity to learn how um, people are working on this kind of extreme environment um, and um, what uh, can be done there, what can be studied there uh, and uh, this year first um, we want to organize this uh, snow beat workshop with collaboration of um, SLF in Davos uh, where we would also bring our members um, to SLF Institute and to show them how to analyze the snow peat, how to uh, predict the avalanche and how to study this. So our main message today is to show you that we're doing kind of nice activities and we encourage you to join but our second message is to, to try to attract new members. So we feel like we're kind of in a transition zone where a lot of our members are not early career anymore so they kind of left us in that position or went outside of Switzerland. And I do see a lot of new faces around, young people, so please join us. 
Uh, it's free, totally free, it's important to mention, I will repeat it, it's free. <laughs> you get about one email a month from us with an activity, a conference a possibility, uh, what else? Uh, we have uh, a lot of different information, uh, conference activities, uh, networking and presentation uh, workshops. Uh, so it's very nice to have a bit of a different uh, information from different sources. Uh, but also, if you join to our listserv, so Apex Switzerland, we're the Swiss branch of Apex International. So you will always also receive a newsletter once a month from Apex International, which then have a bigger, uh, broader scale. Uh, you can have collaboration uh, project groups. If you have a very good idea, you can then uh, jump on the Apex International uh, movement too and uh, create a, a good network. Uh, so my two main message again, if you are if you never heard about Apex Switzerland, join it's free and it's just one million a month above. If you're a PI, please provide that information to your group and people. We do feel like the PIs are aware of Apex, but they don't necessarily communicate it. The young people joining don't know about us. And uh, I think you're the, the best speaker uh, to really convey that information among the early career people. Uh, I wanted also to mention, I saw some people with their phones scanning the QR codes. Uh, this is to join the Slack uh, channel where we also provide our information. You have, we have a new now WhatsApp group because we are trying to make it a bit more interactive so people are not from the same department, the same uh, university. Or if you go to Bern and you don't know anyone and you want to chat about further research, then you can find someone there. Uh, but I'm also happy to see some of our members here uh, today. Uh, so Lisa really well explained our next events. But I want to showcase the one that is going to happen next month, exactly in a month, the 12th of October. Uh, it's going to be in Bern. We're trying to change the location of our different activities. Uh, but for this one, I think we think Bern is a quite a central location. Uh, where, like this I explained, we're going to try to remove you a bit from the lab, from the conferences, from the technical vocabulary, and try to make you uh, think how to uh, convey information, scientific knowledge to uh, on social media, to uh, policy makers, to uh, journalists. And for that, we have two very nice keynotes. We have Michael and uh, Oli that will die from Polar Journal. So they're used to really uh, vulgarize scientific uh, uh, information uh, to a broader public. And that's what we're trying to, uh, to uh, push our uh, next generation of career scientists in polar research to do. Uh, another thing that is important to know is that we're going to be in collaboration with the uh, uh, Alpine Museum. So we should have the curator of the Alpine Museum to give a keynote, uh, which will probably be very, very interesting. So I think that's it on our part. We have some flyers. So if you visit, if you did not have a phone good enough to scan, you can have a flyer. Here we have some in front. And again, a flyer from the Polar Journal uh, workshop on science communication just in front. And we hope to see you soon in one of our events. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So, my name is Bastien Rios. I'm a PhD student from the University of Lausanne. And today, I will introduce you to an expedition to the Canadian High Arctic where uh, we deployed a drone based GPR system. And this was uh, financially supported by the Swiss Polar Institute, so thanks again. So first of all, first of all, sorry, I will introduce the system. So this is part of my PhD. The first step was to develop this drone-based system. So how it works is that I put a radar beneath a drone, we fly above the glacier, the radar is emitting uh, if it was working, okay. It's emitting electromagnetic waves which enters into the ice, it comes back, and then from the time of propagation we can locate things into the ice. So that's uh, in a nutshell how it works. And the second step of the PhD was to use it on Alpine glaciers, and the naturally last step was to go in a polar area to deploy it. So as you all recognize, this is a, a map from the north of, uh, of Canada. Here is Nunavut, the northernmost region in Canada. And all the way to the field sites took us from uh, Iqaluit, a little Inuit city, to a research base station which is called Resolute. And then from there we took a little plane, flew above the magnificent Ellesmere Island to reach the final study site, which is the northernmost uh, land in Canada, which is called the Warland Island. It lies at 84 degree north, and it's only approximately 700 kilometers to the North Pole. And there you have a very 
very little camp, which you can see on the picture. And we were three of us there uh, for one month in the last, uh, last month of May. It was Eva and Elliot, two uh, colleagues and our friends from uh, Montreal. And we were living in the little white dot on the island. Um, yeah, and just in front of this island on the northern side, you have a glaciological structure which we call a nice rise, which I circled in red here. So basically, it's like a layer of freshwater ice, like a glacier above the ice shelf, so a layer of salty ice, and all of that is anchored on the seabed, which is permafrost. So we have this three layer system, and that's what we are coming to study. And my part of the work had two different objectives. The first objective was the development of a drone based GPR system. So we had different questions before being there. Will it work under like, very cold temperatures, low GPS coverage, and also how is it going to be the data quality? And as you can see in the video, it worked very well. We could deploy it. And we could do different tests on the speed of flight, on the radar orientation, uh, antenna orientation, uh, the flight direction, and also like, we could assess the quality of the data. So the first objective was uh, fulfilled. We are now able to, to acquire uh, very high quality drone based nuclear data in polar regions efficiently, safely, with the best quality possible. Um, and the second objective obviously was to acquire uh, meaningful data. I'm just going to show one profile here. So this is like one GPR profile. So I flew the drone along one line. And then what we are seeing here is like a vertical slice from it. It's like if you take a cake, you cut it, and then you look from the side. Kind of. So here, well, you can see very hard reflections, and you can try to map things within the ice and look at the different structures. So we have the ice rocks, so the freshwater ice, the ice shelf, beneath we see the seabed and the seawater. So we can really separate these different components. And this is only one profile, but you can imagine that we have a lot of them parallel and then we can do 3D models of the structures. So the second objective was also fulfilled because these data are uh, new uh, for, for this area, at least. So thanks for listening. I'm leaving you with a little video of us dancing uh, on the coast of Canada and I'm happy to have you chat with Thank you. and temporal variability with it. 
And that's one of the dangers with it, because where you have an intense warming, you will also, because of instability, have some cooling, as you can see in the blue colors here. But overall, the warming is uh, the event. Coming uh, to the area that I'm mostly uh, conducting my research is the Southern Ocean. I'm a sea ice uh, oceanographer by training, uh, but everything is connected, so we need to look at the snow, the sea ice, the underlying ocean, the ice sheets, the chasing, and obviously the atmosphere that's ever present. And I just wanted to remind you that the Southern Ocean provides an Earth system function that is annually judged at or measured at 250 billion Swiss francs. And that's based on assuming a 90 uh, a, a cost of the uh, CO2 that's budgeted by our governments. And so uh, you see there's quite a lot of money tied up in the Southern Ocean that probably most of us don't really appreciate. And that's a take-home message that uh, someone asked here before uh, to the first speaker, Michael. What can individuals do? What can governments do? What is being done? And I think it's very important for us to realize that the Southern Ocean, like the other oceans, have quite a big impact on, uh, on the economy. And so uh, the processes that happen there are not uh, far away from us, but very well connected with our uh, social security, with our health and our physical security. Here I show you uh, what you hopefully have seen before. It's the sea ice extent for each year, January to December, and then the extent in uh, square million <coughs> kilometers. And you see in summer, February, March, there is a minimum. You see the gray lines, that's the last 44 years of data. We had the Antarctic paradox where, in, despite the global warming, the Antarctic sea ice from 20 10 to 2014 actually slowly increased and in 2014 the only time it exceeded 20 million square kilometers. So the paradox is why can sea ice grow and occupy a larger area, surface area, while the globe is warming, including the Antarctic as in the picture above. And so there's two, um, there were two hypotheses and the combination of them uh, proved true. So you have increased melt events on the glacial ice sheets that provide a fresh water lens which freezes over further and you had a lot of uh, equatorial winds like from the pole towards the equator pushing the ice out. More concerning however are the dark green line which was 2023 sea ice extent and the blue line which is this year's extent and you see that they are falling well below the long term mean and this big strong bold black line of the 45 years before, uh, not only during winter, but also concerningly during the summer. And so there's a lot of things happening in that system, it's preloaded, and uh, if we are going further on with warming the atmosphere, we will have a shock in that system. And the takeaway message is, uh, a lot of our science needs to be settled into the policy, so obviously if you have less sea ice, you expose the glacial uh, elements like the floating ice shelves and the ice sheets, to the open ocean, you remove the belt of sea ice that holds in the glacial ice and you contribute to sea level rise. You hopefully have all seen this tipping point figure uh, by Armstrong McKay et al. And we already now don't know if I dare, uh, added some extra points. I noted them uh, with uh, the plus 1.5 centigrade warming, which we have exceeded a couple of times in recent months. And so, um, Anstrom and McKay they actually looked at tipping point and thresholds for scenarios of plus 2 centigrade, between 2 and 4 centigrade, and above 4 centigrade. You see that they are all basically, uh, most, not all, but mostly concentrated where we have cryospheric elements. So, obviously, in the Arctic, in the Arctic sea ice demise, you would have heard the excessive melt of the Greenland ice sheets the permafrost saw, uh, the barren sea ice loss, but also the south where we have had multiple events of West Antarctic ice shelves collapsing. We also know that the Wilkes subglacial basin is at risk and obviously we have now seen the sea ice uh, collapsing. So I leave you with this figure and um, I really would like to see some stimulation uh, about what where I'm moving, I'm at the other end of APEX, so I'm on the senior side, to realize that science is one element, but we need to very well connect with society and we need to inform and really force decision making. Um, there's a saying uh, in some of ours, we are the last generation, 
And I think we all can make a lot of uh, contributions to it, not least when we step up to elections, but also have to, uh, have, to have a healthy con uh, discussion between science, society and the decision making. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Daniel, for the invitation. So my name is uh, Stefan Elischer. I'm the manager of the Forel Research Platform. And I'm here um, today to give you a quick overview of the Forel Heritage Project, but also um, of the sailboat, and give you a couple of words about what we have done uh, in 2024. So the project goals uh, were to offer Switzerland and uh, international community a unique uh, motor sailboat uh, dedicated to polar science and uh, to focus on coastal research, to be uh, complementary um, uh, of the big uh, research uh, ship. And uh, another goal was also to train uh, sailors and uh, young sailors and scientists the challenge of polar region. Let's have a quick overview of the ship itself. So the ship uh, belongs to the Forel Heritage Association. Uh, it sails under the Swiss flag. It has a length of around uh, 30 meters, uh, a width of around 9 meters. It has a relatively small draught between 1.5 to 3.5 meter, which is really useful to do uh, coastal research. We have uh, two masts, which are uh, rotated masts, uh, which allows us to have a lot of um, space on the deck. And we have uh, installed a new engine, engines, 400 horsepower engines. Uh, we have a great autonomy, and we can add 30 tons of fuel uh, in the sailboat. And we can uh, accommodate uh, 12 people on board, 6 scientists and 6 crew. And the hull is made uh, of aluminium, which is a really good material to sail in polar region. Uh, during 2024, we have done a refit of the sailboat to be uh, a research platform. So we have added uh, laboratories inside the ship. So we have a wet lab, a clean lab and a dry lab. We have also installed a big winch to be able to deploy uh, all kinds of instruments uh, to 1,500 meter depth. And uh, to be more attractive to the scientific community, we have uh, added or equip equipped the ship with uh, general uh, oceanographic equipment. Uh, for example, the CTD rosette, a ferry box, a military station, and filtration woods. Let's have a quick look at the inside of the ship. So the ship is divided into two big spaces. The front of the ship is the living space with the a big mess area, the kitchen, the living rooms, etc. And in the aft of the ship, we have the, all the labs and the technical room. So we have the wet lab, the dry lab, and the clean lab. We have also a lot of space in the ship for storage and also a big uh, platform at the aft to deploy uh, all kinds of instruments. Uh, during the 2024, we had the, the pleasure to collaborate with the uh, Green Floor team. So we had the six uh, Swiss scientists on board. Um, they have used the, um, the atmospheric team have used the, the dry lab. Uh, we had the oceanographic team or that was uh, studying more uh, trace metals that has used the clean lab. Here you can see the really uh, big platform that we can uh, deploy all kinds of instruments. Here have the CTD rosette uh, that is uh, being deployed. And we have also uh, the pleasure to uh, collaborate with a Canadian team from the Laval University and the goal was to do a survey of the dentin fauna and also to uh, construct <coughs> food web. And during this expedition we have deployed uh, different kind of instruments or sediment grabs, uh, nets, uh, drop cams, uh, CTD rosette and, and etc. So in summary, uh, scientists were really happy of the platform and uh, the platform is really working well. And uh, for uh, 2025 and 2026, we plan to sail uh, in the Canadian Arctic and in Greenland. So if uh, there is anybody that is interested of, in making collaboration or using uh, the sailboat, uh, I will be pleased to do not hesitate to contact us uh, or look uh, on our website. We have also uh, Betis Renier, the captain, who is in the room, and uh, Jean-François Brigitte, uh, who is also part of the association and also part of the Swiss Polar Foundation. So thank you very much for your help and for the listening, and do not hesitate to contact us.
Japanese Kung Lee. I'm a PhD student at the, at the University of Bath, working on isomer analysis for uh, pelvic climb reconstruction, reconstruction. So this morning, uh, we should, uh, a little bit talk about the ice core analysis. So let me explain why we are looking at ice core. So as you can see in the figure, uh, aerosols are continuously emitted into atmosphere from different sources, desert, uh, forest, ocean, and volcanic eruptions. So some of these small aerosols are transported over long distance uh, through this atmospheric circulation and uh, eventually can reach the Antarctica. So it can uh, deposit on the Antarctic ice core, Antarctic ice sheet, and it will uh, store it in the Antarctic ice core. So by analyzing the aerosol in the Antarctic ice core, we can get some insight into how the past climate has changed before. Um, this Antarctic ice core has uh, three very unique features, uh, which makes kind of their analysis quite difficult and challenging. Uh, if you if you measure the uh, inland Antarctic ice core, uh, it will be two to three kilometer long, and uh, this long Antarctic ice core, the ice core contain a, a continuous high resolution record of past climate change. And also, this Antarctic ice core is one of the purest ice on Earth, which uh, makes the, the risk of contamination very high while handling this sample. So, to address these uh, challenges at the University of Bern, we use very innovative and brilliant uh, methods, which is called Continuous Flow Analysis, GFA. Uh, in this process, we uh, carefully melt one side of ice using a uh, gold coated plate, which is also called a uh, melt head. So this melt head is the funnel shape, so that we can take the melt water from the inner part of the uh, ice core, which uh, has not exposed to any contamination risk. So the melt water, I hope it works. So this is the, how we analyze. We cannot see much actually in this video because we very slowly measure but if you focus like, carefully you can hear some uh, air bubble pumping sound yeah <laughs> not super uh, yeah, sound but uh, anyway yeah from this uh, melting uh, <coughs> So the melt water from this uh, melting system actually can be measured using different instruments but in my case I use a single particle ICP top MS but I won't go into detail of this instrument but I want to highlight two different uh, key advantages of this instrument uh, due to the time of flight mass spectrometer we can measure quite wide range of the analyte from 23 sodium to 238 uranium and it has very high time resolution uh, in a millisecond scale so that we can measure uh, elemental composition of the particles and dissolved background elements so let's uh, take a brief look at this uh, result, initial result so you can see 10 different samples here uh, next axis shows the depth of the sample from about 300 meter to 3 kilometer and why it shows relative abundance of uh, el uh, major elemental particles uh, of Earth. So, for example, if you look at the blue line, um, the iron particle actually takes up about 60% uh, of our detected particle, um, uh, regardless of the test. Actually, we, uh, we found a very interesting point here. Uh, we initially expect um, the relative abundance of this major particle of Earth uh, would stay kind of constant but if you look at the particle containing uh, aluminum in orange and potassium in green actually they changed um, so this finding actually aligned with the previous research, uh, research uh, 
So they, uh, if, yeah. if you look at this upper figure, uh, this shows the uh, aluminum uh, containing mineral whole band and actually decrease like, with depth and the potassium bearing mineral gel sites uh, increase. So they found the dissolution of this aluminum bearing mineral uh, whole band with depth and the formation of gel sites uh, uh, in glaciers. So uh, they conclude that this finding uh, is not a climate signal, but it's better than the better uh, reactions occurring in this uh, glacier itself. So, yeah, furthermore, uh, our next step would be to identify the origin of this mineral dust to get more information about uh, our Earth's climate preserved in ice form. Yeah, thank you. And you can see as well a large difference between vegetated and unvegetated sites. 
uh, which is to be expected. Um, and we also looked then at the soil microbial community with the genetic analysis using 16SR RNA sequencing. And you can see here the microbial diversity at the phyla level. Um, this is very preliminary, but we also look at how this um, correlates to the environmental variables and the gas flux data. And we can use further genetic techniques such as metagenomic sequencing and analysis to see the functional potential um, of the soil microbial community and really kind of uh, determine the processes that are influencing this gas exchange that we observed. Um, so these are the next steps that I'm taking. And if anyone is uh, interested during lunch, you can find me and we can discuss this field or the region as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jonathan Farben. I'm a postdoc in Sabine Wumms lab uh, at the University of Basel. Um, and I want to give a quick overview of my uh, current postdoc project there. Um, so, Imagine um, a mountain landscape that is quite heterogeneous um, and in, uh, my, in this particular case or my interest um, in terms of temperature. Um, and then imagine yourself being a plant uh, in the middle of this landscape in some like an, an open spot um, somewhere on the slope, um, no particular uh, special location. Um, and maybe you're even a grass because other grasses are quite cool, they actually carry their babies uh, on top. Um, and then uh, alongside yourself, you will have some other species growing in that location. Um, and then uh, thinking about this place from a temperature perspective, um, the temperature will vary a bit during the day, um, as it does, um, yeah. And then there's also other places in this landscape, uh, very close by actually, which um, might have completely different uh, plant communities. Um, some places that are colder, so uh, down here in the depression, you might have some, some colder temperatures. Or uh, up on these, uh, on a ridge like this, um, you might have a lot of temperature variation over the day, uh, which will yet again um, attract a very different plant community. All right, so what happens now when temperatures rise, or what could happen? And we know um, that they have risen a lot already uh, in the mountainous regions of this world. So um, you might actually get some new friends in those places, um, some other species turning up, uh, coming up from the lowlands, and um, yeah, not only, um, yeah, it's maybe not only nice to get new neighbors in this sense, um, though it generally is, I would say, uh, from a human perspective, um, but this might actually cause uh, the local upland species to disappear uh, because they just can't compete with the species from the, coming up from the lowlands. Um, and now, comparing with these special locations, um, on the ridges or in the depressions, um, again in very close proximity, um, but the changes in the community in these places might actually be a lot smaller. So this is all basically theory so far, um, because to actually understand and predict these things we would have to know what is very local temperature conditions, like how they change over time. But Basically, we don't have that, and this is what this project is actually about. Um, getting temperatures at a small scale uh, for the Alpine region over decades. Um, so, yeah, that's the main, main goal of my uh, postdoc project. Um, getting a mechanistic model running to um, really get the local temperature change over time uh, for the Alps, or for the Alpine zone of the European Alps. Um, I've just come back from the field yesterday, actually, uh, where we collected vegetation and temperature data that we'll use to validate this model. And if you have soil temperature data from somewhere in the Alps that I don't know about yet, then come talk to me or send me an email or get in touch with Biene. Um, and yeah, I'd be happy to 
to chat to you about it later. Thank you so much. of music, so I'm actually from the humanities. And uh, I'm here to present to you very shortly my SNF Talk from Seha project with the working title Performing Inuit Sovereignty through Kalajanik Kalajak, which I started last year. So in my project I am engaging with Kalajak Kalajanik as a framework or a scope to explore the following three research questions. Um, I'm interested in sonic colonialities and listening positionalities, so basically how one listens to sound and makes sense of it, and if there exists um, sonic imaginations of Inuit and the Arctic. Secondly, I am asking what the function of Karachak or Katachanik is today and for whom, so I'm asking about the recontextualization of the performance. And thirdly, I am interested in the intercultural exchange of knowledge in music, in the context of musical collaborations with Inuit throat singers and musical compositions that are including Karajak, Karajanik or mixing it with other musical forms. As some of you might not be familiar with this Inuit work again, I am going to show you a very short video of the song Himiwalpi which translates to the puppy. <coughs> Um, 
is related to ice coring. Actually, we wanted to start already in the first two years to doing ice coring on Fechenko Glacier. But unfortunately, we had a problem that we could not use helicopters and we, it's really necessary to use helicopters. And therefore, still, we have no helicopter. Even this year, actually, we had maybe a slight approach to use a helicopter, but it still was not possible. So the problem was now that we probably cannot do the drilling of the Chenko Glacier, and we are looking now to another place where we maybe can start to do the drilling. And we found a place actually in the eastern part of Tajikistan on a small uh, ice cap actually in Kom Chukubashi uh, area, which is close to Karakul Lake in eastern Tajikistan. Currently, some of our people actually are staying in the field and they're doing GPR measurements, radar measurements on, on this ice sheet to look if we maybe can next year do, um, do some of the measurements actually at this place. So we already see that working actually in Pamir is not often very easy, so we have to cover a lot of problems also, local problems also. To access also the region is not easy because it's close to Afghanistan. It's a very yeah, protected area also in a sense and it's quite heavy actually to, to work in this uh, area. But we could also do some uh, cosmogenic uh, exposure data. We also could publish this year one of the paper which is related to Koksu Valley, which is in Kyrgyzstan, also in this area of uh, um, Pamir region. Then, of course, we have a cluster 2, that's actually the cluster which I also um, leading. This is related to permafrost. Here we could progress a lot. We did a lot of geophysical profiles, actually, in the Pamir region, but that also at other um, places. And also one paper is now um, sent in for review where we can actually show we have measured now on different um, sites uh, at, in Central Asia and that actually this is really the first time where in Central Asia um, was done a lot of geophysical measurements to really investigate also the state of permafrost. So uh, I think this is very important and we also started now to do some approaches where we can actually simulate the permafrost distribution. I think this would be a great advantage in the future to see how is the distribution of permafrost in these regions and we collaborate also um, with our colleague, uh, colleagues from SDSC where we have a good relation now where we try now actually also to do some different types of permafrost models more um, on a larger scale, but then also more on a local scale, maybe more on small catchment areas. And we also did some new uh, measurements also related to uh, ground um, surface temperature measurements. And then actually the biggest cluster is the glacier snow hydrology cluster led by Francesco Pelliciotti actually. There were involved many people and, uh, related to snow observations, to glacier observations and hydrology. And there we are working actually since many years in this region to establish uh, in situ mass balance measurements on different glaciers in Central Asia. And we, I think we could do a lot of progress because we have now many glaciers in the area where we have regular observation each year. And of course, in addition, also we work um, strongly with uh, satellite information actually, where we get out some very interesting information. Maybe I can <coughs> just mention one paper is in the review now also, where uh, one of the PhD students investigated actually the um, Abramov glacier, which do some, some pulsation. This is like some mini searches this glacier produces in the last uh, decades and we could observe now that this glacier did that about three times so I think this is very interesting if people are uh, interested at that they could also look in the cryosphere is uh, this uh, paper now and then uh, our, my colleague actually um, in uh, SLF Joy Fides he developed some sort of a snow mapper tool actually where you can look how actually the snow distribution in Central Asia works for different, catch, for different catchments. It's a really nice tool um, which he uh, developed uh, together with uh, uh, Tobias Siegfried actually from Hydro Solutions. 
the mass balance I already mentioned, of course, there is also a lot of work with the satellite images. We use Pleiades images, but also other images to really see how the differences are. Just a side remark to this year was actually very, very negative. So in general, if you were in Central Asia, the glaciers looked really very, very bad. So there we could very often do not see any accumulation area at all. Uh, and then, of course, we have also a lot of studies uh, in, related in hydrology. So, a lot of hydrological measurements were done also in relation to the observations which we have uh, close to, to the uh, glaciers. And I think this is particularly interesting because on most of these glaciers we have also mass balance measurements and now we have also um, uh, runoff measurements uh, below. And I think the, this is really interesting to study in the future and I hope that we get some very nice results out of it. Then we have uh, cluster 4, which is uh, led by Tom Batten, actually. So these microbiochemistry um, uh, observations, which they look actually also in the water, in the rivers, uh, below um, the glacier, but also take some cores out of the glacier. And last year they did some experiments in, uh, in Tajikistan, and this year they were mainly active also in Kyrgyzstan, also in the Koksu Valley, actually where Abramov uh, Glacier was. And then we have the um, cluster 5, which is uh, mainly related to cryosphere hazard, which is like, led by um, Simon L from the University of Zurich. And they also could do some uh, very nice observations and interpretation of glacier outbursts, flood occurrence and mechanism mm -hmm. in the rushed area. And also they looked um, for some Landscape changes are actually in, in the detachment of this uh, Petra Pervogo um, range where they also had um, some hazards observations. And then we had uh, the cluster 6 actually, um, which looks more for the history of glaciers. They were also very active. They go to the archives in the different countries in Central Asia, for example, in Uzbekistan or in Tajikistan and look actually also the history of this glacier development in this region actually of the Pamir and also they could do some very nice progresses. And then I especially at the end I want to thank to the SPI because they helped us a lot actually also to have some administrative uh, work actually in our cluster and uh, I'm very happy that you helped us so much that we could really proceed now and uh, in general, we, um, I think in most clusters we are quite successful and we hope also that at the end we are in cluster one also make some step forward to hopefully do the drilling next year. Thanks very much. Oh, I forgot actually one last, <laughs> last thing which is actually very uh, important, sorry. Uh, we have actually also the general flexion. Sorry, this is really a fault of mine. I think it's really important we not only do the science stuff in general, but we have some very, very important uh, other information. So, for example, we work for a publication actually of a children's book, um, which I think it's really a great opportunity we have. And then I also want to say that uh, particularly our female people, but I think I support it also fully. They work very hard to increase actually a gender balance um, um, environment uh, in Central Asia, which I think is fundamentally. And I want to congratulate really the people this year. They could <coughs> establish actually also field work where we had a full gender balance. So there were 50% uh, female people and 50% um, male people, which I think is really um, fantastic. And uh, also, of course, we have a lot of exchange between the students. So, sorry, this was very, very important, and I had to mention that. Um, I'm very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and I do realize that I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch, quite literally actually, so I'll try to stay on time, but yeah, it, it may be a bit of a challenge. Um, for those of you that don't know about this flagship Greenfield, which 
has been mentioned by the talk about the forum earlier. Thank you. Um, here's just a very brief reminder of what we are up to. So we're looking at Greenlandic fjord ecosystems and we're interested in how they respond to a changing climate from a lot of different avenues. Um, and I think this image really summarizes it, uh, summarizes it quite nicely. Um, and I'm also showing the main responsible people here because of course this is a large group effort. Um, and some of the cluster leads are also in the audience today, so you can talk to them uh, at lunch if you're more interested in something specific about the project. Um, and now I will just run through last year's activities, mainly of those various different clusters. So a bit of a tour de force, because there has been a lot going on. And I'm starting with the cryosphere cluster. I believe that you guys have accumulated the most person field days uh, last year. Um, successful but challenging was the, the two word summary. Um, I, I can totally imagine. I think the access to our area in southern Greenland is a little bit easier than Parmia. It's mostly the bad weather that can stop us from getting there or back home. Um, but still it's a, a super interesting environment and I think that's nicely illustrated by the photo here of this carving glacier um, that has been intensely studied by the cryosphere cluster this year with six independent sensors that co-detected the complex glacier ocean interaction and um, yeah I will leave it at that if you have more questions about it Andreas Elias in the audience that you can you can uh, ask at lunch. Um, moving on to the marine cluster, they have also managed to get relatively close to the carving glacier front. Here's a nice image of the uh, Sana. We heard earlier that they were also active on the Forel this uh, summer. And the first findings are already showing distinct differences, which is also, I think, very nicely illustrated by these two, two photos. So on the left hand side, we have a picture from Semelik Fjord, which is the fjord that has a marine terminating glacier at its end, um, compared to Igaliko Fjord, where we have a land terminating glacier that is bringing in a lot of sediment, which you can see as this uh, blue on here. Oh, you can see it, I don't need to specifically point it. Um, and this has far-reaching consequences for the ecosystems um, in those two different fjords. So they have already seen that there's much more productive conditions in the fjord with the marine terminating glacier. Because the fjord with the land terminating glacier remained really stratified throughout the summer. And I should mention that Sandra Card is also here if you have more questions about this. Then moving on to the atmosphere cluster. They have also been quite active this summer and they actually provided a very, um, well, scientific slide, should I call it, um, where I had to spend some time to actually understand what they're really showing me here. Um, but, so what you're seeing is um, uh, particle formation events that they could observe on sunny days in the marine terminating glacier fjord. And um, so what they're showing is the particles over time and that they started forming in the afternoon and they could really work on understanding this process better thanks to the campaigns and their instruments that they brought to Southern Greenland. And they also observed significant differences between the two fjords, which was quite interesting. So that means that if we change the fjord dynamics, we may also change the atmospheric nucleation events that are happening in the region, which then in turn affect the local climate. Um, the land cluster is the cluster that I'm leading. Um, last year we didn't have our own dedicated field campaign because, well, several different reasons, but one was that we already had a lot of samples that we had to look into. Um, and I'm just showing a map of uh, a master pieces actually where the student was looking at a lot of different streams and rivers uh, some originating from glaciers, some
some not, and we were very interested in um, determining what is being transported by these streams to the fjord environments from the land and how the components may differ depending on the water source of those streams. And I should mention here that we also have a nice collaboration with the Swiss Data Science Center. Um, there was uh, Lucas in the audience who was helping us a lot with um, getting catchment properties for all of these different uh, places here. The biodiversity cluster is one of the kind of overarching um, entities in our project. Um, they have also been quite active, obtaining new samples, mostly from the marine environment. In, in this picture we can see a pump that has been deployed um, to in situ filter water at 600 meter depth. And then um, the plan is to characterize the biodiversity in the fjords and um, compare the different locations. But they are not only working in the fjords themselves, but also have done already a lot of genetic analyses on all kinds of different matrices, uh, which I think is really fascinating. So they have samples from the air, collected from the atmosphere cluster, fresh water and soil together with us, and then um, they are looking at eukaryotes, bacteria, animals, and plants, and how they're distributed through the different compartments. And last, but very much not least, we have the human cluster, um, that is interested in how the people living there experience the fjord environment and the changes that they are observing. And um, this um, year they were specifically interested in the youth's perception of climate change and their livelihoods. Um, so they conducted uh, workshops at schools and a lot of youth interviews, but they also managed to take a youth and also an elder onto uh, one of the field trips, so onto the Adolf Jensen together with the Kreisfield cluster, so that they could actually also go to the well, close to the target front of the marine terminating glacier altogether. Um, and uh, last year, I don't know, maybe some of you remember that um, they were conducting a photo contest in the region so that the locals should submit their favorite um, place or image illustrating uh, something important about the fjord. Um, and this year, uh, we as Green Fjord actually want to give back to the communities um, uh, a book of this photo contest. And that's the, in the middle there, you can see an image of the of the book cover, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing that as well. Um, yes, so that was all from my side. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's always difficult to be if it's one in the afternoon, so I will try to wake you up. I will be talking about Antarctica. Uh, I am Sergio Gonzalez Guerrero. I am an atmospheric scientist and postdoc in uh, SLF Institute in Davos. Um, my project is about uh, climate impacts in the snow in Antarctica. Um, as Petra said before, uh, this morning, Antarctica is quite a transversal <laughs> continent. Uh, we had, for example, a very big uh, increase of the temperature in the Antarctic Peninsula, but instead, uh, uh, in East Antarctica, we had almost no warming in the last uh, decades, <clears throat> but uh, during the last uh, few years, in more or less 2020, it's been a big increase of uh, extreme events. Uh, maybe you can recall from the newspapers that it was in 2020 the highest temperature ever recorded in Antarctica, or uh, it was in 2022, uh, this uh, or 2023, I cannot remember, in March, a uh, very big uh, heat wave in East Antarctica. Uh, so the Antarctic uh, community, atmospheric community especially, but also multidisciplinary, is working, is shifting a lot into extreme events, and it was demonstrated uh, during three weeks ago in the SCAR meeting. It was a very big uh, workshop on Antarctic extremes, especially that it was more than uh, 100 participants. Uh, in many places of the world has been like, uh, uh, very big interest on 
uh, studying attribution, uh, climate attribution, in, in especially in, winters, in Western countries. But in Antarctica, it's only two studies. They are led by me, by the way. And on, on if we can attribute uh, the uh, uh, stream event to climate change. So the next uh, logical step, step was a little bit trying to understand the impacts of these stream events and if they cannot be attributed uh, to climate change. So this is why the motivation of this work. And you can see, for example, here in this, uh, in this image is uh, Ross Island in the Antarctic, in the East Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, how during an event in uh, December 2022, it was a big depression of snow from here to here. Uh, this has, of course, a very big, uh, very big implications in permafrost, for example, or in ecology. So, my interest is try to understand how this snow is depleted uh, and what is the contribution of the climate change. So, how do we do that? Uh, I am running uh, what is called a storylines with uh, the global warming simulations in this region. And basically, storylines is like telling two stories. One story is what it happened, and the second story is what could have happened if, uh, if it was not uh, climate change. Uh, I don't have time for going to the details, but we are doing this uh, with our model Cryowolf, that is a, a snow, an advanced snow atmospheric complex uh, model uh, that allows to understand the processes that are occurring. And we are ready in point core resolution, we can see that this is the input data with the temperature difference uh, from ERA5 uh, analysis model, atmospheric analysis model, plus the uh, global warming difference uh, using CENIPSIS, uh, the climate models. But when we do the scale using cryoworth, we start to see very, very interesting uh, meteorological processes. I cannot explain here in detail, but it's, uh, for example, change in stability of the atmosphere. Uh, that implies also changes in temperature and, and moisture, etc. Uh, if somebody wants uh, <coughs> to talk more about that, we can do it in the coffee. But basically, the takeaway messages of this is that, uh, yeah, just with semi-seeds models, we cannot uh, understand this uh, very, um, <coughs> very uh, high resolution, uh, very high resolution uh, processes. So we need like more high resolution models for understanding that and sometimes we came out with quite surprising uh, effects that we did not expect. Thank you. All right, hello everyone, I'm Lucy, this is my one slide. Um, so this is my first uh, open forum in person, so I thought I would just take the opportunity to introduce myself to the polar community. So I'm uh, currently a postdoc at the University of Lausanne, but I will soon start an ambizione at the University of Geneva working on polar microbial ecology. So I'm a microbial ecologist and I started my PhD at uh, Northumbria University working in Macroarctic, which was a big Mary Curie consortium. Um, and during that time, I worked on the uh, diversity of microbial communities in soils and in Arctic ecosystems. Um, and if you look at the first map in orange are all the points I collected during that time. Uh, everything's been published now, it's open access. Um, so that was the first time I got introduced to the polar regions. And then I also had the opportunity to be involved in ACE, which was also uh, organized by the SPI. Uh, for this, my PhD supervisor, David Pierce, joined uh, the ship and collected air samples all along the tracks. And I analyzed the data of those air samples, looking at the diversity of microbial <coughs> communities. And what you can see on the very colorful graph is just that the communities change every day. Uh, every sample is different and the turnover is very, very high. Um, and we were wondering if we would observe the same in the Arctic. So we are currently repeating a similar um, expedition 
and you can see the different tracks on this map. So currently my uh, colleague is on the ship somewhere in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, uh, collecting air samples still. And when he comes back, we'll be doing all of the molecular analysis of those microbial communities to evaluate their diversity and their uh, distribution across the Arctic uh, region. This was also funded by the SPI with an exploratory grant. And the last project I wanted to mention is the SLIDE project, which took me to South Georgia um, in 2021. And because we observed that those um, microbial communities change day to day, we decided to stay in only one spot and sample for sample air for an extended period of time. Um, this is currently in writing, but what we observe is that they still change, but they're a lot more stable if you stay in the same place. So this should be coming out soon um, in the next couple of months, I mean, if I get working a bit on this. So um, if you want to know more about what I've published, what I've done, um, you can scan this. It will take you to all my papers. I'm happy to chat also during the break. And the last thing I wanted to mention is what I'll be doing for the next couple of years. So I'll be doing my own at the University of Geneva starting in 2025. I'll be um, keep I'll keep working in the Arctic. I'll be investigating the microbes that are arriving in the Arctic regions, characterizing them, culturing them, um, trying to evaluate if they can colonize Arctic ecosystems, what the impact of those colonizations are going to be on those local Arctic ecosystems and how climate change is going to impact those systems as well. Um, and that's all for me. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to present to you some, some nice pictures of a recent uh, field survey I did three weeks ago in the north of Alaska. Uh, my name is Noah Sturry. I am a prehistoric archaeologist. I recently finished my PhD thesis on uh, Stone Age graves in the Alps. But anyway, today I want to talk to you about this project here that received the Polar Access Fund by the SPI. Um, it is situated at the Humanities in the Arctic uh, platform of the University of Bern. My project partners are the University of Alaska and Fairbanks and the Bureau of Land Management um, Alaska. The title is Arctic Landscape Archaeology in Northern Alaska. A bit better would have been to name it in, uh, in Northern Inland Alaska because we were focusing on this region here around Galbraith Lake in the Brooks Range. And if you check out here the map, it's a bit tiny, but uh, we're, we're really in the top north of Alaska, but not at the shores, because the shores are rather well or better understood archaeologically, better studied than this inland mountain region. So we uh, were camping some 10-12 some, uh, days here at Galbraith Lake and decided to do um, on-ground surveys. So this meant that we uh, were hiking through this beautiful wild landscape looking for potential archaeological sites and mapping them. For example, we were looking for these stone um, accumulations like this, so tent rings, or uh, flint chips, so chips from flint that when, they, when, 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 when you make flint tools there are a lot of uh, chips or of course charcoal fragments. Um, we also hiked up to, to the mountain ranges, uh, up to the mountains, to survey these ice, uh, ice patches because I'm sure many of you know, but when, when it's really hot in the summer months, the caribou, they flee to these ice patches to escape the billions of mosquitoes that we have here. And of course, if you want to hunt them, then the hunters, they also have to go up to these ice patches. And sometimes you maybe miss an arrow or you lose a tool and then in theory it's perfectly preserved in the ice if we think about uh, Ötzi, the Iceman for example. Um, so we hiked up these mountain ranges and uh, for safety reasons and to cover more ground I, I tried to do most of it with a UAV, so with a drone. You can see me here with the drone and with the, the SPI hat, so I was wearing it. Um, <laughs> But of course, we need to be realistic, this is really searching a needle in the haystack. Um, more success, or a lot of success, we had on this plateau here. It is located on the Attican River, 
and on the section where you see the erosion, where the plateau erodes into the river, um, we found on the surface we found on the surface already a lot of flint chips, so from tools that were produced. So I decided to do, with my local project partners, we decided to do a test excavation here. And in this only one and a half square meters uh, excavation unit, we found 4,392 flint chips. So we counted them by hand. But that is an incredible amount of flint chips. And also we found some 12 uh, really nice, big, uh, broken flint tools. Here you can see me holding like two pieces of a flint dagger that was broke. So our interpretation is that uh, the, 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 there was a camp on this hill and they were producing like flint blades and arrowheads and the, the chips, so the debris, it accumulated here. The charcoal samples we recovered from here are maybe bad preserved, but they are currently being analyzed at the radiocarbon laboratory at the University of Bern, where we'll hopefully soon have more results. And the aim of our project is really to understand more about human uh, environment uh, interactions in the past. For this, we wanted to combine the archaeological records, the archaeological data of the landscape we tried to gather with this on-ground survey, together with indigenous knowledge. So we were lucky enough to, to go to meet the local Nunamut Inuit uh, elders at their village of Anitubuk Pass. It's located some 30 miles to the west of where we were camping. Anitubuk means caribou droppings in their language, which, uh, which I thought was, was interesting. And it was really fascinating to speak with them because this region here in Alaska was the first known contact that we have with Euro-Americans coming there was not until 1885. So until 140 years ago, they were hunting with bow and arrow and flint arrowheads. So for us archaeologists, that's, that's really fascinating. And this was also where the last nomadic people of North America lived. So they, they settled in their village only some 60, 70 years ago. And I was able to speak with their elders, and they remember they grew up still in the nomadic lifestyle. So we try to now combine the data we gathered here with the indigenous knowledge and hopefully find out more about human environment interactions in the past in Northern Alaska. Thank you very much. Okay, hello everybody. So my name is Max Potsim. I'm currently a PhD student at the Create Lab at EPFL. Um, I will graduate at one point in the future, and then I will be postdoc at the Create Lab, and who knows what the future will bring. My background is a bit different. I have just one slide. I guess I become more Swiss the longer I stay in Switzerland, so I stuck to the one slide. In the Create Lab, we built robots, and this is a bit of an advertisement talk where I want to say that robots have the potential applications in uh, all the science. In our lab, we built the kind of robots where conventional robots are no longer useful. Like we design systems that work where other systems don't work. So where rovers don't work, I've seen a lot of drones. It's great to see technology in the community more. But there are certainly applications or environments where the current tech that you can buy is not useful. And that's where we come into play. So we built these new robots. I'm going to present one, so what you see on the slide is actually, it seems like many, but it's actually just one robot. Um, can I have one? So we have these like versatile, robust, lightweight, adaptive robot platform for cryospheric research. Um, what is it? Um, so this is a robot because we don't know what we had to design robots for, we design one that does a bit of everything. So this robot can change its shape quite drastically, so it can like it's like a tent, like you, most of you probably know these throwing air tents and then they just unfold. It's pretty much the same thing. We just put some wheels on it, some propellers on it, made it a bit buoyant and waterproof. And then we end up with this system. So we have a robot that can change its shape to be a ball. Then it protects the payload in the center of the robot quite well. Um, it can unfold, then it can use wheels to just drive around in quite rough terrain. Uh, it can also swim and 
now it can also fly actually. So it can somewhat do everything. It's not useful yet, right? Like we need to put some sensors to it to actually make it useful uh, for applications and this is one here. So what we can see here at the top is a bit what the robot does. Here I highlight the two things that we have used the robots for. So here on the left it's us, it's like, or this is me. The robot is quite lightweight. It can be made smaller or larger if we want to. Um, here I carry it on my backpack to um, to the moulins of the Mer de Bas, uh, Mont Blanc, and there we go down into the moulins and we have mounted a laser scanner on the robot to um, actually make some 3D models of the, of the moulins. And then what I'm actually interested in to see is where does the meltwater from the surface of the glacier go when it drains through the moulins. So what happens at the bottom of those moulins, where does the water go and how does it horizontally flow off. Like, Humans can go down these ice shafts, at one point it becomes a bit too dangerous for humans to just traverse horizontally. And I think this is a great application for robots. This is what we see on the left. Um, this work is supported by the SPI, so I'm very, very thankful for all the um, support from the SPI that I got to do my research and to go to these environments. On the right is another application that we've realized. So here is the robot in its ball shape. Um, we have the payload of a sensor in the center. Ten poles are quite flexible, so these like, do somewhat shock absorption. And what we have done here, I was not in Greenland, but I gave it to Liam Colgan. I guess many of you have heard about him, so it was like a rather spontaneous collaboration. They took it with a helicopter to a crevice field in, in Greenland. Um, it's called the Semper Crevice Field, and currently they, they don't know how wide these crevices are and how deep they are. Uh, that's what they are interested in measuring. They couldn't use satellites because of the limited resolution. So they said, can we not use a laser scanner into robots? And they just came back, so it looks quite promising, the data. So it's cool to see my robots somewhere in the world and doing meaningful things, like helping scientists to answer questions. Some other applications, like because we talked about volcanic slopes, like just two weeks ago, one came back from observing a volcanic slope, like the ash field um, of a volcano in Japan. So a student from, like, went to Japan and tested it there to like, measure the depth of the ash. So there's like, all sorts of applications, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, now the advertisement. Uh, I talked about laser scanners that we can have. We can have cameras on these robots. Uh, we heard about biodiversity monitoring before. I think these robots have potential, like, they have solar cells, so they can operate in the field for extended periods. Um, they have to potentially increase the spatial resolution and the temporal resolution of our monitoring in the field. And this is what I, what I want to leave you with. Come up with ideas, approach me, please. Uh, I'm always happy to chat uh, whether technology can offer some <coughs> advantages for you or not, uh, for your questions. Thanks a lot. charge of the events and the mediation at the Alps, the Swiss Alpine Museum, and I'm not a scientist at all, so I have the pleasure today to preview our upcoming exhibition for you. Thank you, SPI, for this thought and for everything else. And we will start with that. So what you have just watched what is a small teaser for our upcoming exhibition, which goes by the title Greenland, everything changes and will open in October. It will be a film-based exhibition with projections and interviews on screens. And visitors will experience the exhibition by plugging in their headphones at every video so they can listen to people telling their stories. Uh, in fact, we don't want to explain Greenland, but we want people to get to know different uh, perspectives and narratives. Our focus of the um, exhibition lies on transformations. Climate change was obviously the starting point for Alps' journey to Greenland. Therefore, we also filmed at the Oeschke Center in Bern, where a Greenland ice form was analyzed. In addition, we quickly noticed that there are other shifts and many more, many more changes we want to shed light on too. 
For that, we made three field trips to Greenland in the past uh, two years. While going through the rooms of the exhibition, you will encounter people talking about growing up in small villages, others talk, talking about a Greenlandic clothing brand, what an Inuit identity means for them, or about the opportunities of tourism. It's about the boom in mining, about the relationship between the centers and the peripheries, about agriculture changing due to climate change, and also about fishing. Along the way, uh, along the way while visiting the exhibition, a fact and figures room invents, um, invites to discover key aspects of Greenland. And also, that's my favorite part, in the end of the exhibition, we install a music room where visitors can listen to Greenlandic music in all its varieties. Greenlandic music is not only amazing in its diversity, but in many cases also very political and a way of expressing oneself. To make this exhibition possible, we teamed up with different partners, among others the Swiss Polar Institute, Öschke Center, and the SPI flagship project Greenfjord, but also institutions in Greenland, such as the Arctic Hub that coordinates science in Greenland, or the National University. Apart from such scientific collaborations, we also approached musicians and artists, fishers, teachers, CEOs, professors, politicians, entrepreneurs, hunters and farmers. Of course, without the support of all our interviewees and translators, this exhibition would not be possible. So I'd like to end my slot by introducing two events where you are kindly invited to come by. Um, we make a controversial tour series, we named it. We will take you through the exhibition accompanied by an inspiring guest. And among others, we invite tourism expert uh, Monika Banti tanner in, in April to walk with us through the exhibition and tell us about booming tourism and what it means for the locals. And in March, Julia Schmale, um, professor at the FPFL, as you know, and responsible for the Greenfield project, will talk about the role of Greenland in regard to global climate change. And just now, uh, we are busy, very busy, setting up the exhibition, and there is a lot of construction work going on. Um, the exhibition will open on the 25th of October and will stay for almost two years. So you have a lot of time to come and visit, and I hope to see you there soon. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Ilaria Sampin, and I'm a postdoc researcher at ETH Zurich. My research focus is Korea geophysics, and especially the application of ground penetrating radar to glacial environments. It's not the first time today we, we heard about the ground penetrating radar, so just to remember, ground penetrating radar is, an, is a geophysical technique, an electromagnetic technique which allows to provide a detailed imaging of the subsurface on the basis of the contrast between electromagnetic and electric properties of materials. Just for comparison, you can think about uh, something like uh, medical x-rays uh, in which you can get information and, and you can look at your bones uh, even without looking directly at them. That's what GPR is for. This is my way of viewing this technique. What I'm going to show you is some quickly, quickly example of what you can get from a GPR image and can show you how many information you can get from internal structures of especially glaciers. Here, uh, there are two uh, couple of images of uh, some field work I performed. On the right here, uh, two years ago, I've been to Antarctica and I performed some ground-based GPR surveys in order to better characterize the geomorphological setting of a specific area close to Antarctic Antarctic Station. While on the left, we have two pictures of uh, two fieldworks I joined this summer with the 
on Swiss Alps, especially on the Oberalps Glacier and Cerus Glacier. The objective for this two field campaign was to get some information about the ice thickness and also some detailed characterization of the internal structure of this glacier. So here you can see us walking with uh, carrying the instrumentation, but once we carry the instrumentation on the surface, what we get? We get images like that. My focus, my job actually is uh, identifying as many features as possible and actually give them names. So associate what I, I see here with some real glossological features. So actually we start drawing actually drawing lines, the most evident one, and then I try to associate them to what I can think they are. So we start with the most evident one, and then we start thinking about that. So the most evident one you can get is the bedrock, so the base of the glacier. This is the first information we get every time, which is essential for getting ice thickness information of the glacier. But this is only the first, uh, the scratch, the surface of uh, the, all the whole information we can get from a GPR image. After the bedrock, we can see, maybe we can get information also what is inside the ice thickness, so the most important part, we can have information about the water table, and also we can have information about transition between uh, frozen materials, so between uh, snow, fur and ice. Also, we can even get say, we can also say something about the state of the ice. Let's speak about state, but it's most likely we can speak about clean ice or, or warm water saturated ice. So we can even see say that it's a dry ice or wet ice. But that's not enough because we can see even say something about uh, past events that occurred on the specific uh, study area. For instance, we can see something about the past erosional event, like this unconformity. And we can even say something more about glacier movement or some structural characterization, structural movement, as the shear, the shear <laughs> bands in here. This is just two images, two pictures, two profiles, and look how many information we get from this. Imagine doing a whole, with a whole survey, so a um, high number of this type of profile along the glacier, how many information we can get, how much detail we can reach, and how much we can characterize the glacier. Not just in terms of ice thickness, but the internal state, in terms of water content, structural movement, past events, and whatever we can try to reconstruct. I know it, I saw, you see that here we are just walking, but of course we, for bigger survey we can use helicopter or uh, even drone base, as our drone base colleagues showed us this morning. And I know it was, it was a really quick, uh, quick presentation, but it was just to show you the detail of these images. And for me, this is the most astonishing thing. Actually, we can know something about the internal structure of a glacier without looking directly at it, just dragging something on the surface. So, if you are interested, I maybe moved your curiosity a little more, you want to see more GPR images, just come to me, we can speak about it, and I'm always happy to share images about this wonderful environment. Thank you very much. and I am a postdoc in Simon Jacquard's body group at the University of Lausanne. Um, first of all, I want to thank you uh, for having us today on behalf of the Carvice team. We are a team of four, led by Professor Simon Jacquard from the University of Lausanne and Sarah Fawcett from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Carvice contributes to and benefits from the ocean cluster of the Swiss Polar Art Institute's Green Fjord flagship, flagship initiative, and with that oceanographic work in particular, we aim to better understand the fate of the marine biological carbon pump in the face of vanishing ice. 
the marine biological carbon pump encompasses biological processes uh, leading to the formation of organic carbon in the sea surface and their export to the deep ocean, where it might remain isolated from the atmosphere for hundreds of years. So this mechanism is very important uh, for climate regulation and therefore uh, deserves our attention, time and effort. Indeed, if we want to obtain uh, reliable predictions of ecological and environmental changes, um, we really need to understand how the marine biological carbon pump evolves in polar systems and along rapid, um, rapid transformations due to global warming. Carbides is a tale of two polar systems. First, we went to the southwest of Greenland um, in July. During two 10-day oceanographic cruises on board research vessel Forel and Sana, we sampled two contrasting fjords. Broadly speaking, one representing many present fjords and the other one re representing uh, more and more common fjords in the future. So these are, uh, we have a glacier fjord receiving lots of ice from many sea-terminating glaciers. And there you can see a picture of Sana with us on board, surrounded by ice, that has a tremendous impact on how uh, light reaches different depths, on how nutrients are supplied and in the water column stability. The picture below, in contrast, show a uh, land fjord um, <coughs> near Igaliku, and this is how more and more uh, fjords will look like <coughs> in the future. And still, in these land fjords, we can see a very strong impact of uh, vanishing distant glaciers, not as uh, inputs of ice, but as inputs of very sediment rich plumes uh, due to riverine discharge of glacier eroded uh, material. So it's clear that uh, we are transiting more and more to with this kind of uh, fjords, land fjords, but it's a, a little bit more unclear how the biological carbon pump will change and what the magnitude of that change will be. In this sense, um, <coughs> CARBAS is an observational project with very motivated scientists to face challenging sampling conditions. We need to provide um, new observational data sets. Data that may help uh, advancing in marine biochemistry, carbon and nutrient cycling and ecosystem functioning. The kind of data that we are producing are related to novel isotopic techniques and also uh, very well established radiochemical methods. So we use isotopes of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, as well as the uranium thorium pair for particle export. We also look at microbial communities in particles and also trace elements and so on. And all this to better understand the top-down and bottom-up um, controls on the marine biological carbon pump. This is the first part of Carbides and next year uh, we are going to visit the sea ice edge of Antarctica. Um, we have two cruises, we have one cruise uh, that's going to happen in the South African part and we have another backup cruise uh, happening in Brunswick Strait. So uh, we are very open for discussion and criticism and first of all I would like to uh, please uh, model us and observationalists and let us know what kind of samples and uh, data you are interested in because perhaps we can take samples from you or we might focus on a particular brain or a particular process that is not yet very well resolved in your models. Please come to talk to Sam and to myself and also uh, follow us on Carvice Ocean on Twitter to get regular updates about the work that we are doing with. Thank you very much. Cryospheric. Um, I'm just just one project partner. It's a jointly led project from different um, people in Bhutan and in Switzerland, also from different institutions. And the project mainly aims at improving our understanding and awareness of the cryosphere in Bhutan and of related risks and changes that are affecting the high mountain communities in Bhutan. As I said, it's jointly led, so there are people involved from the Royal University of Bhutan, but also from the National um, Hydrological and Meteorological Center in Bhutan, different institutions in Switzerland, 
And very importantly, I'd like to mention that we have two PhD students that are located in Bhutan. And they're actually going to be of the first ever PhD students that receive a PhD degree in Bhutan. So Bhutan is really building up their um, university system and the project is also aiming at supporting this. Um, I also like to mention that there's an open um, postdoc position based in Switzerland and if anybody is interested, um, come talk to me afterwards. I'm happy to provide some information. The motivation um, stated here is uh, very brief and clearly it's very important and we all know mountains are changing very quickly or the environments are changing very quickly. They are heavily impacted by climate change and the community suffered from higher risks or more uh, frequent risks and extremes. But the project really goes beyond. So we aim at really improving um, or like educating and building up expertise locally to have a long-term sustainable um, Christberry community of scientists, but also um, the government <coughs> being aware of the Christberry in their country itself um, over a longer period and not only for the project. Therefore, if we look at the work packages, there's basically only one work package that clearly focuses on, like, we say, classical cryospheric sciences. That's the first one. We want to build a baseline data set, um, whereas cryospheric only focuses, well, only, not only, but it focuses on um, snow and permafrost. It basically leaves out glaciers, because glaciers are already quite well studied um, locally from NHCM. So we do complementary research, but then still there is one work package just focused on this baseline data set. Um, the second um, work package focuses more on impacts and risks, and there we specifically follow a gender-specific approach where we want to analyze gender-specific vulnerabilities, such as case studies looking at how uh, women working in agriculture are specifically impacted or affected by changing um, hydrological regimes by landslides and so on. This is a field that is very new and we really hope that we can move forward and contribute to this very important research. And the last one is capacity building. So we, there are different study programs that evolve now at master's levels, at PhD's level, um, in, at the Royal University and we are in contact with lecturers and professors and we build modules to um, provide Cryospheric scientists basics to more sophisticated modules to the students. And this is going jointly, so there's an exchange teacher teacher trainings, there's exchange people visiting us in Switzerland and so on. The project really just started um, in spring and the last month we're mainly focused on fieldwork or preparation of fieldwork because actually uh, from the four people involved in Switzerland so far, I'm the only one here because two are already in Wuhan and the other one is flying the day after tomorrow, to have the first um, jointly uh, field campaign with the researchers from Bhutan, where we um, basically can profit from their mass balance measurements on Tana Glacier, which is shown here in this uh, image. Uh, it takes about a week to get there uh, by foot, and then they will stay there for about a week and collect data. And the Bhutanese will focus on the mass balance measurements and the Swiss um, people will more or less teach the PhDs and some other researchers to install permafrost loggers. So we will deploy some temperature loggers, over 30 <coughs> loggers in the catchment area of Bhutan, uh, of Dona Glacier. But also there's going to be an installation of a snow fox, so to get very accurate um, snow water equivalent measurements. And the uh, already running automatic weather station will be modified with more up-to-date um, instruments. After that there will be an international workshop focusing on climate extreme and dust risk reduction and this is really a, um, a, a key message that we are really open for collaboration with this uh, SNSF funded project. It's Swiss Bhutanese led but very very open to NGOs, to governmental agencies, to other researchers that do research in Bhutan or have ideas to do research there. So please come and talk to us. So, I'm Mark I work in the HSSU, and we have developed the 
small computer called HFC2. So it's a helicide flight computer, version 2. The purpose of this, this computer is to be embedded into this uh, balloon and into the box below. It will be, uh, it is connected to several instruments that um, does uh, gas analysis. So the purpose of the project is to send the balloon into the atmosphere and analyze the uh, particles that are in the atmosphere. This is Julia Schmalek, who uh, is uh, responsible of the uh, laboratory of PE Herald, the Extreme Environment Research Lab. So the computer collects the data from all the devices, so there are several gas analyzers, temperature measurement, uh, pressure, uh, we have a camera to take pictures of the environment. Um, we do temperature re regulation to the, the box. Um, we have a GPS module to get the position of the, of the balloon. And all of this information is stored into a, a single file in the memory of the computer. And part of it is, is sent over a radio link to a, a base station, which is on the ground. I think it, so it was, uh, the first version was already on the ship we, we showed before in the Antarctic. And the information is used to, to manage the flight, to, to see what is uh, observed. And part of the data is sent to the ground. And you can uh, decide if you want to go higher or, or lower. The base station let also send commands to the instrument if you want to change something, uh, turn on the pump or whatever you can do with these instruments. So, I, I'm shocked and I think it's all I have to say about this project. Thank you very much.